were talking a little bit uh, during the break, you know, about the concept of hope, and we always want, want to, you know, think in that way. I, I think uh, it's, and, you know, it's hard to come to a meeting sometimes, and we, we as doctors sometimes even hesitate when we show uh, what you already know that are the survival curves, right? Because they're just a reminder of the difficulty of what we, uh, you know, what we all face. And, and, but the reality is we're all in those curves and they're a different shape for everyone depending on what our health status is. Um, but I, I, I use an analogy of a, a very famous Spanish writer, Garcia Marquez. In one of his books, you know, one of the characters goes and asks the other one, you know, why do you love me if, you know, our love is impossible? And the reply they get is, why do we breathe if we ultimately all die? And that's really kind of a testament to the way I see things and, and you know, as we interact with patients, as long as you would allow us and you want us to try things, uh, we're, we, we will keep trying. And I'll show you some of the things uh, on how I, I convert kind of those concepts on things that we're talking about. Now, in, on that venue, I'm going to start by showing you this picture, which I often show in my talks. It's very common. I show this picture. This is the physician is painted in the, late, in the middle 1800s by a British painter, and you have this physician here attending to this girl. She's obviously quite ill. You know, the lamp here show, is casting some light to what she might have. And um, the mother is grieving back here. The father has her hand on her shoulder. So it's a very uh, sad situation. And this picture is often shown in medical meetings by my colleagues to somehow almost to emulate the time of medicine that appeared to be more romantic. You know, there's maybe even a thought, maybe this was the golden age of medicine. And, and certainly this physician has a lot of attributes that we all need to have when we see patients, you know, of humanism, compassion, empathy. Uh, but this physician lacks something that we have now, and that's tools. The physician has no tools. This girl could very well be dying from a strep throat infection, you know, which we, we would just consider incredible today. And, and, you know, they may be talking about the cure for strep throat back then. How are we going to be able to get around that? So the good news, and I'll, I'll refer back to this physician picture at the end of my talk, this, this physician actually uh, had, again, no tools. So back to those curves. Uh, this is a study we did, and I, I want to show you again, I'll see how we march with the progress. And um, uh, Dr. Kumar has uh, publish other papers, but we did something that's called um, a real-world data, and I think you're going to see more and more of this research, where we actually uh, look at a cohort of patients, a very large cohort of patients, where we actually got claims from insurance companies. So, you know, the insurance companies know every time something is being paid and they have to get the diagnosis right. So we started actually with 20,000 myeloma patients, which is larger than any myeloma clinical trial ever done. And we kind of whittled down to close to 10,000 patients based on some eligibility criteria that we had to follow up and we had the number of, of time points. And then we actually cross-referenced this with the database of the Social Security Administration where everyone, some, someone passes away, you, cannot, you record that, of course. So then we could calculate times from the time of diagnosis until the time a person was uh, noted in the Social Security Death Administration. And what we, we've learned is that we actually can do the survival curves. And this is what has happened over the last several years, 2006, 2007, this is a curve of survival, 8 and 9, and then 10 to 12 is up here. So this is another view of the same data that Dr. Berg Siegel was showing you. So, and the, the way I call it, every time the curve goes up, there's hope. That's what we're hoping. Now, what you see here in black and gray are the curves for the general population in that same insurance database. So there's, of course, other diagnoses, other health conditions. But as long as this cur curve keeps going upwards, that means we're making progress in myeloma. Sometimes you'll hear in the lay press or even in the medical literature, people kind of decry, oh, these cancer therapies are no good and they're not helping everyone, anyone. This is clear proof that they're helping patients. I mean, there is progress. There's something a lot to be proud of by you know, patients and physicians and everyone else. And mind you, this stops at 2012. Uh, as we have tools, as Dr. Bergsagel told you, I anticipate the curve will continue to go upwards. Where you, this curve doesn't really show a great effect of carfilzomib, daratumumab, certainly not CAR T cells by specifics. So right now, what we need, and, and I'm going to tell you how we're, gonna, how we're gonna talk about how one navigates this curves. This area here, however, you can see the beginning of a diagnosis, the first two years, are still very challenging. There's somewhat, one might argue, little progress, and that has to do with the high-risk multiple myeloma. So that's, that's an area which is a focus of, of the myeloma crowd. Now, when we talk about therapy, you'll know about this CRAB criteria, and uh, one of my favorite sayings now is that CRAB, crabs have legs and they have uh, claws. 
So there's a dangerous part for the crabs, right? The legs are the elevated calcium and the anemia, and that's not to minimize the significance that might have, but we as physicians know we can correct that quite easily. We worry more about the claws, which are the problems with renal failure and bone disease. And you see here a patient with a bone destructive lesion. This is a femur, so this is a thigh that has been broken. And um, you know, this person will have to go through surgery, and probably in a femur you can have a very good functional result afterwards, you know, despite obviously who wants to go through surgery. But if you have compression fractures of the bones, that is a big problem because you can have them in the in the back, for instance, and that can lead, of course, as some of you know, I'm sure, chronic pain and the difficulties with that. And then the R is for the renal, which is, uh, you know, uh, sometimes we can reverse it, sometimes we can't. So sometimes patients will be, um, uh, have to be connected to a dialysis machine, et cetera. So these are some of the things we're, we're keeping in mind. But I just want to say these are the two things that we have to keep at the very forefront of everything we do uh, for you as we engage in patients. I'm, gonna, I'm sorry, I'm going to go through this quickly because some of this we already covered. So as we, as we think about strategies, I'm going to throw around a couple of concepts of things that we think of, you know, how do we position and how do we think about the best alignment of the drugs. And this is, this is uh, something uh, we are doing um, in general. So, you know, the first time someone needs treatment, we call that induction. And uh, for the patients who are eligible, you do the stem cell transplant. Now, this may change in the future because right now we have this very quick dichotomy, stem cell transplant or not stem cell transplant. Uh, one possibility is that maybe stem cell transplant in the future will go away, that you know, there will be other treatments, whether that's more of the same drugs, whether that's CAR T cells. Um, so that we don't know that, but right now this is kind of a very important decision point, whether someone goes to the stem cell transplant or not. Then we talked about maintenance, and you saw some of that data, and, and the data for maintenance we're going to expand a little bit. Uh, right now, I did mention before that almost all patients are placed on maintenance, uh, you know, with very rare exceptions, mostly with lenalidomide, which is Revlimid, and in some cases we add the protosome inhibitors. And then we're going to talk about the rescue strategies. But you have so many players and you have so many drugs, and we have at least, you know, um, 12, um, you know, drugs with um, an infinite number of combinations. Really, it's a very, very large number of combinations that it is a challenge to know how do we position these drugs and you know, how do we go about, about uh, the, the optimal uh, duration of therapy. Now, talking about hope again, if you are a newly diagnosed myeloma patient, and, and this number is, again, it's not a guarantee for anyone, but just to throw some numbers. If one goes through induction, that's about four to six months maybe, and then you go through a transplant that's say another three months until you get to the day 100, we're talking usually about, you know, say eight months, for instance. So eight months until you kind of come out of the transplant and you have your, your, your first assessment at the day 100. And nowadays, the vast majority of patients will do very well. With one of the treatments we use, patients will do very well and we'll get to that position. And stem cell transplant, uh, even though it's, it's a big deal, should never be minimized, the mortality is less than 1%. So we have the majority of our patients can get up to here. Then you get to maintenance, and in maintenance, what you're going to do is lower the dose of, of a drug, and that's why we use lenalidomide. And I did say that if you take 100 patients, the clinical trials are saying somewhere around 50 months. So, you know, if you add those two numbers, we're talking about five years from the time you get the first treatment until the time one is facing the first intensive next line of treatment. So this is way better than we could do before. And again, that doesn't mean that anyone has assured five years. There's some patients that will need treatment sooner, but then there's other patients that will be post those five years. All it means is that of those 100 patients, 50% of them will have required treatment at that five-year mark. And individually, we, we can't uh, fully predict. Now, I'm going to go back to the stem cell transplant. This is one of the common questions. We got a lot of questions in the, in the, in the first panel. And Dr. Bergsall was saying what we mostly practice, under 65 or under 70, most patients get it. 70 to 75, you know, people who are quite fit and, and active. And over 75, it becomes much less common that we would recommend it. But also because if you just take this out and you say, I'm just going to use treatments like the induction and maybe some maintenance in someone who's 75, there's a pretty good chance that, you know, we can get that person into, into the, you know, years 80 and so forth. And, um, you know, and I know when, when one gets to 80, you say, well, I'm not done. I want to get more time, right? But in, when we look at time frames, it's about very close to what you can do with the general population. So I think the risk of transplant is higher and the benefit of transplant would be, would be different. But 
The stem cell transplant, again, this is a very, very important point to, to discuss. It is an individualized decision. So what we do, uh, there's a secret formula. Every time we walk into a room to decide if someone is a transplant candidate, the main factor is just visual. So we've read the medical record. We've looked at your labor laboratory records if they come from the outside. But you know, if we walk into a room and we see a healthy person and you know, we say, well, you know, from what I read, there's no medical, major medical issues, we would normally say in those age categories, we, we would suggest that you go through the transplant. Now, if we walk into a room and we see someone in a wheelchair with oxygen or you know, with uh, difficulty engaging in a conversation, more likely than not, we're gonna say no. There's no magic formula. But, it, you know, things are changing a lot with what we consider the elderly. So the question is, what is the elderly and what should be beyond stem cell transplant? So I'm going to brag a little bit about it here. This guy here on the right is my dad. Now, he was not involved in myeloma, and I didn't know Leif was going to show his dad. <laughs> my dad is a great dancer. <laughs> and this is a picture of him dancing at my wedding a couple of years ago. And he led the party. People have told me, you know, you should invite your dad to my wedding, so at least we have a good dance floor. <laughs> Uh, but the reason I show him, he's 80 right now, and he continues to run. And about five years ago, I tried to run the Chicago Marathon with him. And he told me, son, why don't you go, and then if you need to leave me behind, it's fine. You can just, just go ahead. And little did I know, by mile one, he goes by and says, you're going too slow. I'm going to go ahead and get going. <laughs> so, so, so what is celery? And then this, is, this fellow on the right is Don Wright. And some of you may know Don Wright. Don Wright, also a, a patient uh, with uh, myeloma, who's run many, many marathons, and I would suggest is in better shape than most myeloma doctors. So we really take that into account. We don't look chronologically at the age of patients. Uh, we look at their functional status. And there is no question, it's a big deal, but you know, if someone sits in our office and they tell us there's, I'm 72 and I hike every day and I'm running marathons, I would normally say, you know, at least we should talk about the stem cell transplant. Now, what do you get from the stem cell transplant? I gave you some, some general numbers. So doctors sometimes think that for patients, we're gonna give them this numbers. So we're gonna talk about overall survival, we're gonna talk about progression-free survival. But one of the things we've learned is patients like to look at the tail end of everything that happens. So, okay, if I go through this treatment, what is the best case scenario? And so I'm gonna show you some data for this. These are very long-term outcomes after stem cell transplant from a Spanish group. They looked at 20-year follow-up. And these are, this are the, the results. So this is what they call progression-free survival. That means if, if, if you're in this curve and the curve has not dropped down a little bit, that means that you're a patient there who has not required more treatment. <coughs> they broke the patients into those that got into a complete response then in red, any response but not complete response, and then patients who didn't respond or had progressive disease. Now, these patients were getting really suboptimal treatment, and some of you, if you've been diagnosed for a long time, may have you know, received treatments like VAT chemotherapy, and that's what these patients were getting. It was very, very old forms of chemo. But even with that, about 30% of patients got into this blue curve, and of them, about 30% of patients at 20 years are still here. The disease has not progressed. So these are the patients we're talking about. So this is one of the reasons we do stem cell transplant still, because given what we know, there is a chance that transplant will be the very last treatment. There still is a big gap here. We need to address this gap, and we, we think we're doing that with better treatments. But you have that 30% chance, and, and again, patients don't care about the medians or what we call the hazard ratios oftentimes. We've heard, okay, what is the best case scenario? What could happen in the best case scenario? And this, this is what we see with that. Now, this curve also shows something else, that sometimes you can keep a small amount of a protein, which is shown here by the red curve, and you can still be without progression. Or you have a patient here who has a protein, this is overall survival, so this is, uh, you know, the time a patient passes away, the curve would drop, but then in the red, there's patients who will keep proteins and are doing well. So how do we define cure and how do we define long-term control? Um, it's important, and this is, this is relevant because sometimes if one goes through a transplant and you still have a protein afterwards, it's not necessarily something that immediately causes a great alarm. We prefer not to see proteins, but it's something that um, could not necessarily be associated with a, with a bad outcome. And uh, this is a study that the same Spanish group just recently reported. So they broke down that blue curve that they had before now into MRD positive and negative. So what they show, and this is not as long follow up, but what they show is for patients who are MRD negative, they actually tend to do better. So that's why we're doing MRD negative in our clinic. For patients who were in a CR but were not MRD negative, the results were not that different from where, whether you were in a PR or not. And this is half empty and half full. Half empty is that, well, it turns out if you want to have best results, you have to get into the MRD negative. Half full is sometimes if you have a PR, that can still give you 
uh, good uh, disease control for, for a significant amount of time, as I showed you in the previous study. Now, in that study, 30% of patients got into this uh, CR category, that blue curve. And I'm going to show you very briefly an, an abstract that has been presented of using uh, uh, carfilzomib, rep, dexamethasone for frontline therapy followed by stem cell transplant. It's a small study, so we always take this with a grain of salt. We won't see larger studies, and there's some studies that are being done at the national level. So these numbers may change, but in this particular study, 80% of patients had a stringent CR, and 70% were in this MRD negative category. Um, KRD is not considered the standard of care, and there's a lot of technicalities why we're not doing it, but if, if this were to move, or if other therapies like this were to move for frontline, now instead of just having 30% of patients on that blue curve, maybe we can have 70 or 80% of patients, and if the math holds that we can have 30% of those patients don't have their disease come back, then that would mean, mean in, and in time, Dr. Bergsagel said it wisely, we don't know yet, but in time, maybe we're going to be curing 20 to 30 percent of myeloma patients with current best therapies. So that's what we're, we're striving to do with, with, with this kind of, uh, of approaches. So I, I use this analogy a lot, too. When we, when we think about myeloma, what strategy do, do we use? And let me explain this for a second. If you're a fan of soccer, you know that in your very first game, you don't set your best players. You put your best lineup right from the very first game. So if you're the Barcelona or the Argentinian selection, you don't put Messi, right? So we have someone from Argentina here. You put Messi on game one. You don't say, if we get to the finals, we'll pull out Messi. So what I mean by that is you put your best players forward. You put your best drugs forward. And that's, that's kind of where the field is moving right now. Let's get the best responses up front. Let's try to get the patients into transplant and, and, and see if we can, we can win the, the tournament by doing so. Let's get patients onto this blue curve. An alternative strategy would be kind of like baseball where you can actually save some players for the later innings. Uh, and um, you, know, you, you can have a great uh, pitcher win your game by staying uh, ready for the last few innings of the game. And um, this is a bit of a more conservative approach. Um, sometimes this has been referred as to as cure versus control. And I think the field of myeloma, for the most part, for frontline therapy, and perhaps for the very first time there's a relapse, is more kind of in the mindset of we have to go for the cure. That's, after all, what we're doing with MRD. But when we have a patient who has experienced a number of, of relapses, we kind of maybe sometimes think more along the lines of this, this notion of control. Now, I wish I was this original with the baseball, but this is an analogy that was given to me by one of my patients, um, who unfortunately is not here with us any longer, but he was a huge fan of baseball. And mind you, going back to the discussion about clinical trials, he was the first patient in the world to respond to carfilzomib, right here in the phase one clinical trial for carfilzomib. And he told me, you know, when I have myeloma, I don't think about it as football. He was referring to American football, or whether we would not football here, but I think of it as baseball, because what I'm looking forward is just not to lose. I just want more innings. And with every next line of treatment you give me, I get a new inning. So, so in his mind, if I can get through a treatment and I have the opportunity to then try another treatment, then that's good for me. Some economists have called this the value of options. So if I see a patient today, a first-line treatment patient that we see, and we start him on those treatments that we mentioned, and we go through the transplant, in the back of my mind, what I'm thinking is, I hope that by a future time, if, if this individual were to need treatment again, all of my colleagues in the myeloma community have already sorted out how to use CAR T cells and buy specifics, and have figured out how to prevent some of those serious toxicities that you were hearing about. Because if that's the case, then the benefit they get is not only what they're getting right now from the treatment, but the opportunity they have to try the next line of treatment, that extra inning. So, so that's how we're thinking about the strategy. And I know this is a very nuanced discussion. This is probably one of the reasons we encourage everyone at some point during your management to be engaged with a myeloma expert, because this is not your cookie cutter you know, description you can have from, from, from just a, a general um, oncology discussion about the management of myeloma. This is the data for, for the maintenance with lenalidomide, and I'm going to just read it out because it's very, very small. In blue are patients who are on maintenance, in yellow are patients who are off maintenance, and it's 52.8 versus 23.5 months. When we say it's a meta-analysis, as researchers got the data from three clinical trials and they merged it all together, so they made a super trial. And again, they were able to show that maintenance with lenalidomide was beneficial. 
This is what we call the forest plot, and everything is good if it doesn't touch the center line. And anything that moves to the left tells you how likely are you to need therapy again if you're in maintenance versus not. So maintenance is on the left, not is on the right. And then they put a number of patients' characteristics like age, their sex, their, their stage. And you can see all the dots are to the left. It means maintenance really appears to help everyone. So that's why we're, we're pushing for that. That's what we call a forest plot uh, for maintenance. And this just came out uh, recently in the journal JCO. Um, so that's one. Now, one of the concepts that we still are dealing with is that, um, is that duration of therapy is important. I think uh, uh, Leif was saying that, you know, in, in our mind, the ideal cure would be someone who gets treatment for maybe a few months or a few weeks and then you stop. But as of now, in 2017, long-term therapy is important. So a lot of what we do in the clinic sometimes is encouragement for patients to get longer-term therapies. We think about maintenance, for instance. And the reason for that is as follows. If there's cells that are left behind, you want to keep some pressure against those cells. This is a study that was presented by Dr. Palombo in, in patients who were on treatment, fixed ration of treatment, which is the orange and the purple, and then they stopped, and you see that the disease starts kind of rearing its head up again, versus if you continue, you can keep it at bay for longer. Um, and so this is, this is something, in, in, again, in 2017 that seems to be relevant, that longer duration of therapy is important. And this is another trial. This is the so-called first trial, which is kind of the same thing. Therapy was stopped for two of the arms. And you can see there's kind of a little inflection here downwards, which you probably wouldn't see if you didn't have a yellow curve. But you see the yellow curve here, it continues. We know this, not, this is not easy, so we know that oftentimes, you know, we, we sit with you and say, how are you doing? How's the fatigue doing? Um, you know, we, we probably wouldn't do a good job if we don't go through that detailed conversation, sometimes encouraging you, to, encouraging you to take the medications. It'd be a lot easier to say, ah, yeah, you're tired, let's stop that, no, you know, come back. But uh, it's kind of that mutual and iterative process that leads us to support some of this longer-term therapy. Sometimes we can do that with some uh, medications that are easier to administer. So this tourmaline trial... I've mentioned it briefly, it's this medication called exasomib. So it's exasomib, RevDex versus RevDex. This is Nilaro. And you know, they got a high response rate, and the, the, all the markers are, are, are positive for this trial. Dr. Kumar has worked quite a bit with this drug. And initially I thought, well, you know, it doesn't have quite the punch that we're seeing with some of the other drugs, with even the daratumumab. But then on the other hand, if you have a person who can take a pill home, and not becoming for infusion. There's a huge value to that. And I, what I, I'm learning more and more is that actually there's, uh, there's a propensity, and I can't quantify it right now, for patients being able to stay on longer therapy because it's less intrusive, less needs for a port or a pick line or another stick if you have bad veins. So those things all come into, come into play as we think about longer duration of, of therapy. Now, this is one trial that uh, was published by, by our colleague Keith Stewart. This is the Aspire trial. So this is carfilzomib RD versus RD. Uh, these are the difference in, 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 in uh, uh, number of months that the disease is controlled. So it's two years versus 17 months. Uh, this is not bad, but this is obviously better. But if you look at the response rate in this trial, 31% of patients could get into a complete response. Um, so I could say for some patients in a first relapse, the first time you get relapse, this is kind of like soccer again, like football. You're getting 31% very deep responses, and that's good. Um, if you're a patient who has had a transplant again five and seven years ago, we might think about using a regimen like this and put it into a complete response and then move to the transplant again, and that's good. That's more of the football strategy. Is when we're, we're facing you know, further down the line treatments that we go more with a baseball approach. Now, this is the, the Pollux trial. I won't belabor this because uh, Dr. Berksago showed you this. But when, when all is said and done, it could be that you know, we're, we're going to be you know, in, in a time frame of somewhere between two and four years. It could be that this is going to control the disease. And we have to work, wait for the data to mature. So again, if you have someone who goes through induction therapy and transplant, I was telling you, five years, then you add either this or the Aspire or the, or the tourmaline trial, so we're getting another two years. So we're saying for the average patient, and this is independent of risk, we're talking about seven to eight years for the first two treatments. And, and I hope, again, the value of options. How is myeloma going to be treated seven to ten years from now? Who knows? That's, that's what we're, 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 we're striving for. In this particular trial, again, going back to the soccer analogy, 
It uses very sensitive MRD testing, which is by next generation sequencing, the one I showed you in my first talk. It can measure one in a million cells, and about 12% of patients didn't have any residual cells. No more pink balls. So, so very, very deep levels of, of response. And there's all the caveats and the, the, the comments that Dr. Bergsagel made are very appropriate. Many of these patients had not seen lenalidomide before, but, but it's nevertheless a very, very powerful approach. So I'm gonna finish with this. I wanna finish with a note of uh, you know, supporting innovation and progress and hope. When that physician picture was, was shown, uh, was, was, uh, was made, I'm sorry, um, the first myeloma patient was published in the literature. And this is before we had this privacy law. So there, she, you know, here she is. Um, they got an illustrator to draw her case, and you can see the, the real severe affliction that she had. Which fortunately we don't see anything like that. Her name was Sarah Newberry, and uh, Sarah Newberry's prognosis was dismal. There were no treatments. There were no tools. It was the same time you could die from a strep throat, and she might as well have been born. And you know, in ancient Greece, and this is kind of the grandkid of one of my patients who allows me to use this slide, who's been many years out from a stem cell transplant, and you know, remains in excellent disease control from from his disease. So we always uh, think about the way we live it here at May, and we have that everywhere, even in the back part of the room. That, that the best interest of the patient is the only interest to be considered, and that's that's what we're committed for. And I think with that, I'm going to close, and then thank you for your attention. We're going to move to the to the panel. But I want to leave you with a little, like, um, you know, little humor. If you don't remember how the protein electrophoresis goes, just think about this. Your thumb is where the M spike lives. So this is uh, the way we read those patterns. You saw this from Dr. Kuman, albumin, alpha-1, alpha-2, beta, and this are the gamma globulins. Okay, thank you. <laughs>